As we reflect upon God's word now today, let us come together first in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we've seen your word upon the page, translated for us into a language we understand. But more than what language it's written in, help us to understand your will in all of this. Translate it to our spirit's language, that which motivates and guides our lives. That we will become, like this word, a revelation of your truth. That we will go out into the world, not only speaking its words, but living out its reality. And dwelling in the guidance that we not only have, but may share to offer the good news we have in Jesus Christ to all. And to this may glory and praise be only unto you, O Lord our God. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most humbling experiences for any preacher is what happens when we dig out an old sermon. And this is not me rehashing an old sermon here today with you. But I do dig them out from time to time, and often it is a reflection on how limited and juvenile those old reflections are, or how poor the chosen metaphor was. And sometimes, if the pastor's humble enough, how wrong those words were. Despite years of study, despite continuous dedication to reading the Word of God, and even in the wake of all the compliments of all the congregations at the door of the church saying, that was a great sermon, pastor. That was a great service, reverend. I still have a long way to go before my words on God can come close to God's revelation on who God is and who we are in the love of God. If I can hold into that, onto that attitude for just a little while, I might stand some chance of speaking some truth from time to time if our heart together is open enough. But I cannot presume to speak God's truth even while I read from God's word and while I may possess every kind of training and understanding the church has to offer. To say that I possess the truth is to speak above my capabilities and the capabilities of anyone who is a leader in the church, above my position, just as one minister of the church. The authority of truth in me is that by the proof of my dedication and the evidence of my study and the moving of the Holy Spirit and the will of God's grace, sorry, the will and grace of God, I am permitted to speak the truth and the inspiration that God gives to each person who serves God in the church. We have grown mistaken in our understanding and our practice that by some virtue of our particular perspective we have about Scripture or the nature of God, our theology, our doctrine, orthodoxy, that our particular view is perpetually more prophetic and profound than others. It would be like thinking that Canada is the best country in the world now and forever. It is never absolutely true. And even when it's particularly true, it is only in some ways and certainly not in others. And the longer we hold on to the idea that we're the best and the right and the most righteous in and of ourselves, the greater the likelihood we will cease to even become close to being the greatest nation. Such as many nations fall from their own grace, such as the renewed fall of the church today. We live in a world that bombards us with ideas. Not all of them are good ideas. Not many of them are truth. And it should be the work and the praise that we offer to God in the church, of the church, to help this world discern what truth is. That should be at the heart of our understanding, and our motivation is not so that we are seen as righteous, but so that God is properly understood, that God, God is properly praised among all people. But our attitude too often is, we will discern right and truth and interpret it for others, for the sake of our own gain, for the growth of our own fellowships. So that the authority of truth, the practice of the authority of truth, 
is already misled. For we live in an age without fear of God. And that is a dangerous time. Without fear of God, not just of God's wrath, but of God's love, we act and believe without respect to God, and our self-interest governs us, governs everything we do and the choices we make. Our denominations begin to act as entities within themselves with their own interests, rather than taking their place in the fellowship of faith, willing to put it all in the line to share the good news in Jesus Christ. No risk, no gain. Do we trust in the words of the psalmist as we shared them today from Psalm 111 in order to risk and try and make an attempt and not put off as someone else's job, but to be established forever and ever and acted in faithfulness and uprightness? He provided redemption for his people and he ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name, God's name. Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians an argument against their arguments. Because why is the, a church that should be out sharing the gospel quarreling about food? See, it is not simply that food was sacrificed to idols, but that at certain times it was hard to get any other kind of food in the places where these churches were. And often it would be the food that was it would be the only food that was affordable for the membership of the church and for others who were slaves and not in control of what was put on their plate. It would be the only food that was provided to them. And so Paul makes a fair point, essentially saying, you know, idols are false. They're fake. They're nothing. And food is food. Don't give it a power it doesn't have. In other words, be more concerned with the truth of things than the optics of things, how things look. But don't forget about the optics because some people begin and base the beginnings of their belief on what they see and what they observe. Here's a good example. The Bible does not prohibit gambling. If you bought a lotto ticket this week, you're not going to hell. But... And there's a big qualifier on this. As such, we are warned repeatedly. The Gospel of Mark in Hebrews, Old Testament and New Testament alike, against love of money, against getting something for nothing, and the danger of that, of positioning yourself away from the care and the help of others, and keeping everything unto yourself. God says he will devour those who are greedy, and if people see the love of money in us, whether through gambling or other things that we do or don't do in our lives, then they will fail to experience the gospel from us. They will fail to experience joy and truth from us. And the authority by which they live their lives will be elsewhere. Paul uses the specific example of food, sacrifice to idols, in this letter to the Corinthians. But he makes a similar argument in regards to circumcision, which is, is a requirement in the Old Testament and is not in Peter and Paul's arguments required in the New Covenant that is in Jesus Christ. It is essentially that the way we practice our faith, our orthodoxy, does, does not, must not, cannot become a barrier to people encountering the grace of God in Jesus Christ, or a hindrance to the work and experience of God's Holy Spirit among people's lives. Our concern is the performance of our faith in praise, and not the performance of our faith as some evocation of God. We do not gather, we do not pray, we do not sing hymns, we do not do our good service to make God do something. Such is a false faith. Such a faith puts the authority of truth on us rather than from God. Our faith is not an exchange of favors with God. And even our acts of penitence and service are not for the sake of ourselves or are even our sal the salvation of our souls 
but for the glory and praise of God. Only God holds the authority over our salvation, just as God holds the only authority over truth. But the wondrous reality of God's grace and love is that we are not left idle, but through service and devotion we grow in understanding, we deepen our wisdom, we deepen our we are deepened in ourselves in wisdom and fear of God, and our that our understanding may be drawn up and motivated in the will of God and the moving of God's Holy Spirit among the lives of the faithful. Only God knows and reveals all truth. And if we are paying attention to God and not distracted by the temptations of the world, we grow in our understanding of the author of all truth and the authority of all true understanding and wisdom. God bless you. Amen.